All right. Well, we made it. I think we survived anyway. Made it to the end of the semester. So just one more chapter to cover. Chapter 21, which covers conservation of our natural resources and also biodiversity. We've touched on some of these topics a little bit already, or they've come up in our conversations anyway, but um, now we are going to just use this as a great topic to kind of wrap up the semester. So there's no doubt that we face so many issues uh, today, our planet and us as humans that depend on our planet for our survival. So many things that are affected by our demand for resource consumption. Worldwide petroleum products are the, the, the thing that drives our economy worldwide. Mining oil and natural gas and coal out of the ground <clears throat> and the destruction that that can cause to the environment around it. Certainly um, we still depend very much on wood. Go back a hundred uh, plus years pretty much everybody depended on wood and it wasn't just to build a home out of. It was more about having it as a resource to keep us warm, to cook our food, to keep wild animals away uh, and, you know, build, build your home out of. So we were far more dependent on wood um, in a lot of ways than we are now. But think about most of the people in the world don't, um, you know, don't live in cities. And so they're still dependent daily on going out and harvesting wood to cook with, to heat their, you know, clean their water with, do their clothes, etc. And so even though the more developed countries like the United States do a pretty good job of managing our forests in a sustainable way that we can still harvest timber and, um, you know, have those resources, but, um, uh, but a lot of the world still depends on wood sales for for their, their economy, a pretty important part of a lot of uh, less developed countries' economies, but they don't have the benefit of having a, a good university system and agencies like the Forest Service or uh, Park Service, etc., cetera, who, um, who know how to and have a, uh, a budget to be able to manage our forests. So these less developed countries pretty much do what we did a hundred years ago, which is just cut everything down and, and uh, use it, sell it, whatever. So habitat destruction through deforestation is still a huge worldwide problem, especially in the rainforests, um, but also a lot of other places in the world. One of the challenges that we face in our country is even though we can do a good job of managing our forests, there are still a lot of groups and, and um, you know, populations of people that live in the cities that don't have the connection to the environment like we used to, who don't think the way we're managing our forests is, is that we're not doing a good job. And so there are a lot of laws and regulations and environmental groups that fight um, every time there's a timber harvest plan to, you know, a plan that has to be done in order to cut trees down. And so, unfortunately, what that leads to is a state like California, we have such a vast amount of forest resources that we could use more wisely than we are now. Instead, what we end up doing is, again, even though we have about the third most forested land in the United States next to, um, like, Oregon and, and Alaska, of course, we have to buy a lot of our wood from other countries, Canada, um, even Russia, former Soviet Union, South America. And so we, we, we get this notion of people who talk about, well, you know, we shouldn't be cutting trees down and they fight against us being able to manage our lands. Uh, they're still living in homes made out of wood. They're still, you know, 
resting on, on a wood deck and sitting in a wood chair, but, but they don't want the trees in their backyard cut down, which then, of course, results in trees in other countries being cut down. We get this notion of, well, you know, if I don't see it, it must not be happening. And so um, deforestation is, is a huge problem in other places in the world, but it's really because of us. It's because of our lack of being able to use our own resources wisely and having to buy those resources from other countries. This is especially a problem, deforestation, uh, in countries, for example, like Madagascar uh, and, uh, you know, again, the rainforests in South America, where you have areas that have such high biological diversity. When you clear cut 10 acres in a place like Madagascar or in South America, you could literally drive to extinction species of plants, insects, birds, reptiles, mammals, fish, just by clear cutting a small little patch of forest somewhere else in the world. There's a huge amount of diversity, but that diversity can also be kind of isolated. What you find in, in this acre of forest may be totally different than what you find, um, you know, a mile to the east. Lots of diversity, but again, um, you know, it can be so isolated. And so literally, you know, cutting down an acre or 10 acres or a thousand acres of forest has the potential to drive a lot of things to extinction. A lot of those things we may not even care about, most people, you know, bugs, uh, microbes, plants. But, um, you know, there are a lot of reasons why those plants and insects and things could be hugely important to humans. Food sources for the future, uh, sources of, of um, chemicals that could be utilized as drugs that could be the next best cure for a disease. We do a great job in this country of protecting areas that are unique and interesting. We have uh, had the first, worldwide, the first way of preserving land, our national parks. And we also have monuments and, and national forests and parks at all levels, from city to county to state to, to countrywide. Other countries came on much later in the game as far as protecting their resources. The problem with, uh, with other countries, is, is uh, less developed countries, is, is those natural resources are, are their economy. And so you go back in our country 150 years ago, if you start telling people you can't cut those trees in your backyard because they're special, if those trees in my backyard are the way that I build my house or I keep my family warm in the winter, <clears throat> cook my food, everything else, imagine telling somebody they can't cut their own trees down. And, and that's kind of what, what much of the world is doing with these less developed countries. Don't, you know, don't cut those trees down. Don't, don't um, hunt those animals. When it's their livelihood, um, it becomes a challenge for other countries to impose their will and <clears throat> telling other countries what they can do with their own resources. <clears throat> so at this point, our, our only real best option is just to do the best we can preserving what we have left. If we have opportunities to kind of rebuild ecosystems that we um, damaged in the past, Again, countries like ours try to do that. We do restoration work on habitats to restore them. But a lot of ecosystems in reality have already been damaged to the point where they're never going to be the same. Some ecosystems like um, our, our grasslands in the, in the middle of the United States, something like 95% of those are gone and they're never coming back. Now they're, they're being used for growing corn and wheat and other crops. And so the best we can do is, is preserve what we do have left. Don't let that also get destroyed. It's a challenge, um, you know, because everything takes money. When there's, you know, our, our, our budgets are made for all the different agencies that manage all of our different lands. Um, typically, they're not the highest priority. 
some presidencies have viewed our resources differently than others. <clears throat> Every year, California um, Fish and Wildlife and Forest Service and all the other agencies get get a budget, and um, you know a fairly small percentage of that is is for managing wildlife and taking care of habitats. And then, unfortunately, what happens too much more lately is that we have these catastrophic wildfires and then budgets from other areas get taken away. Uh, so many times I would have students, I would get a job announcement for, for some sort of summer seasonal job. And then, you know, before um, summer even comes, that budget's been pulled back because, um, you know, because the wildfire budget ends up uh, getting depleted because of all the wildfires and that money gets redirected. There's not an unlimited amount of money, unfortunately. And, and usually what suffers the most is the management of our natural resources. It's, it's been this way since, since I've been a student, 30 years. Every year we, we, we set out with these goals of trying to, to do some good things, you know, start putting effort into fixing the habitat, and then there's just no budget for it. And what happens, because of our, our lack of ability to manage our resources, we get these catastrophic fires that, that would never, ever happen in a normal, healthy environment. We, we get so fixated on the idea that the way the forest looks now is the way it always has. You know, lots of trees, and nothing could be further from the truth. So we have to really, really make an effort as a whole society to push our lawmakers to put that money, the budget, into managing the environment. Um, and only way we're going to be able to avoid these catastrophic fires is if we can do that management rather than always just putting out the fires literally. We've done a bad job in the past, uh, you know, going back 100 years. <clears throat> and the idea of all fires are bad, put them out. I think we know better than that now. And, and the managers, the, the people that work for these, you know, agencies, Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, all of those, I, I, don't, I don't know one single biologist who, who um, does a poor job of managing whatever they're responsible for. The challenge is they're not given the money to do what they should do, what they know they need to do. And then we have so many regulations, more in California than anywhere else in the world, um, that limit what we can do. And so that has to change before we're ever going to be effective at, you know, getting our environment going back in a, in a positive direction. Um, so figure 21 here, just one example showing species diversity around the world. And again, you see the trend that near the equator, you tend to have the highest diversity. And also, again, many of those areas are, are being really um, just, just beat up from, from deforestation and habitat destruction, converting forests into coffee production and, and other fruits, and vegetables. And, um, you know, that demand is is still there from the rest of the world. Again, the challenge is everything has to come from somewhere. When somebody in, in our state of California says, well, I don't want you to cut trees down, or, you know, I don't want you to manage the land by thinning out the trees. But if they still want food, they still drink coffee, they still want a nice wooden deck to sit on in the evening and watch the sunset, those resources have to come from somewhere on this map. And where they often come from, again, are the countries that have the least ability to do a good job of managing it. We could provide so much more resources for ourselves in California, and most people wouldn't even see any difference. They wouldn't notice any difference in the way the environment looks. But, um, but it's just this mindset that we have to work through. I mentioned briefly that 
you know, you can cut down an acre of rainforest and, and literally wipe out populations of, of things. And one of the one of the many concerns about that, if you cause something to go extinct, whether it's a plant, any kind of animal, a microscopic living thing, several things that that can go wrong by doing that. First of all, I mean, that species is gone. It's gone, at least right now, it's never coming back. The role that whatever that species is in its environment could be important. It could be a keystone species like we talked about previously. It could have some huge impact on other living things in its environment. And if we wipe it out of the uh, of a given area, we could have an indirect impact on causing other things to go extinct. And then also strictly from kind of a, you know, it's all about humans perspective. There's no doubt that we've already driven plants and animals and, and things to extinction that, that could have had benefits to us. Again, maybe some superfood, you know, some plant that has a fruit that has more nutrients and vitamins than anything else we knew about. Or, like the periwinkle, something that has medicinal properties. Pharmaceutical companies have fleets of biologists who just kind of scour the planet, collecting samples of things, plants for example, and they bring them back to the lab and they analyze them, uh, look at the chemical properties of whatever's in that plant in this case, and, um, and then evaluate those chemicals for beneficial side effects like treating diseases or cancer. If we drive plants to extinction before we've had a chance to even know they exist, much less assess whether they have any medicinal benefit, then we've lost that as well forever. There could be a plant out there that is um, got a chemical that you know could be the the next cure for for whatever disease is, is out there right now or whatever type of cancer. Obviously, to find it, it has to still exist. And unfortunately, again, we've probably wiped things off the planet before we even knew their value to us, but even maybe more importantly, their value to the environment. One way we're trying to address that problem is that around the world, we're developing these, these vaults. Um, this one um, up in the... Uh, um, I forget if it's Norway or Finland, I don't have the thing in front of me, but um, it's an underground seed vault. So biologists, again, around the world are collecting seeds from plants, um, as well as um, crops, you know, food items, and they're storing those seeds underground so that if there were some kind of global catastrophe, or even just if a given plant was driven to extinction in the wild, we would have a, you know, sort of a genetic backup plan uh, that we could pull those seeds out of storage, grow them, and then, uh, you know, produce more seed and then be able to have access to that plant again. There, there are several of these around the planet, underground storage facilities. Some are even now collecting DNA from animals, uh, other, you know, organisms other than just plants, and storing the DNA. So that again, if, if there were a global catastrophe or if we just drove something to extinction, the idea being in the future, if we have the technology to bring something back, you know, the Jurassic Park concept, that, um, you know, first is we have to have the DNA from those things to be able to bring them back. And so that's one of the ways we're addressing the concern over losing the biodiversity on the planet. I'm sure you all know without any doubt that humans are the biggest threat to our own earth, right? The, the, we're the biggest threat to our biodiversity. Among other things, you know, hunting, destroying habitat, those sorts of things, there's no doubt that we're affecting our climate. Now again, this, this is, a, is a great image that when you look at the past and you look at CO2 concentrations, anytime CO2 concentrations 
are higher, we tend to have a warmer climate. And like everything else on the planet and throughout the history of the earth, um, things are cyclic. There are periods um, about every 50,000 years when CO2 concentrations are higher and then CO2 concentrations were lower. When we look at data going back nearly a half a million years, we see a pretty predictable pattern and a, a specific range. Our CO2 concentrations didn't really get much above 300 parts per million and didn't really drop below about 180 or 90 parts per million for a half a million years. That accounts for kind of the normal cycles on our planet. When you look at the last 20,000 years or so, and you see where we are today, how much higher we are than the average over the last half a million years, there's no way that we can conclude anything other than humans have had an impact. Again, we're not the only thing that's ever caused fluctuation. Again, you can see before there were nearly as many of us, CO2 concentrations still varied. Everything on the planet is cyclic. Periods when it's hotter, colder, drier, wetter, more species diversity, less species diversity. But when you see such an incredible outlier and what's different, it's the number of us on the planet, it's the way we use our resources, fossil fuels, burning so many fossil fuels, um, that, that we are definitely having a huge impact on our biodiversity. And then unfortunately, what that leads to is, is more rapid changes to our environment. When, when changes happen over thousands of years, living things can adapt to it or, you know, they go extinct, which again has always happened. Species have always existed and then gone extinct. But what are most concerning to biologists is how quickly the change is happening. And because of how quickly the change is happening, we are, are seeing examples where species just can't keep up. Things are changing so rapidly that they can't adapt. And, and this could lead to mass extinctions that we haven't seen the likes of in, in maybe ever uh, with respect to our planet. The more people there are, the more demand we're going to have for for resources um, that create food or coffee or palm oil. Every time we clear cut rainforest to plant a crop, we're changing that, that habitat fundamentally from what it was. We always think of rainforest in particular as, as really diverse and, uh, you know, really healthy ecosystems, which they are. But as soon as you take the vegetation away, tropical soils are, are really not very good as far as storing nutrients. When there's a full rainforest, it's warm, it's humid, it's perfect conditions for things to decompose. You get a lot of rain, thus the name rainforest. So plants and animals are always dying, lots of moisture, warmth. Things are decomposing rapidly. Nutrients are going through the soil rapidly. Plants can use them as they're passing through the root zone. But um, if you don't keep adding, you know, organic matter, leaf litter, fall uh, leaves, you know, falling out of plants and dying, animals and such, if you take the source of those nutrients away by clear cutting the rainforest, Suddenly the soil, with all the rain, the rain just leaches the soil clean and there's no organic matter in it anymore, which means it's infertile. So then you plant palm oil or coffee beans or bananas or whatever and, and, and it may be good for you know five, six, seven years and then the soil's shot completely and they have to go to another spot, clear cut that, burn all the slash, plant a crop grow it for a number of years. Um, certainly there are 
practices that are that are being used that are more sustainable you know planting coffee beans that have been engineered to be shade tolerant so you can plant them under the canopy of a rainforest much much more sustainable but for so long we did it the other way clear cut everything plant a crop grow it for five years and then we have to move on to another spot also for a lot of reasons um, we as humans have moved living things around the planet more now than ever because of how easy it is to go from anywhere in the world to anywhere else in the world in, in 24 hours or less. Species like the brown tree snake have led to extinctions of other animals, birds, rodents, um, since its accidental introduction nearly 70 years ago. The Hawaiian Islands have been devastated by so many of these introductions. It started with rats. They got transported on ships that were carrying grain. The rats would get off the ship when the ship got to Hawaii. Didn't have the same kind of food source. So then they would start eating bird eggs and pretty much anything else they could. So to solve that problem, we introduced something like the, 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 the snake. Snakes do a good job of killing the rats, but then as soon as the rats are gone, now they got to find a new food source. So that ends up being the birds and the bird eggs and all the other small animals that might be on the island. Oh no, we got to fix that problem. Let's uh, let's introduce the mongoose. You know that's a species that'll kill off the brown tree snake. So they introduce that. Does a good job killing off the tree snake. And when it runs out of food. Back to the native animals. I thought the latest was um, was still that there were mongoose on the island, and what it is now are feral cats, people that just let their cats go wild, and now the cats are causing the same sort of devastation on the bird population. You add in things like feral hogs and uh, and other non-native birds and things and and it just causes this problem this devastation to the ecosystem um, you create all sorts of problems when you start throwing things in places they didn't belong this happened with humans when um, when the Spanish started exploring Mexico um, you know you've got populations of living things whether it's frogs or humans and if they live in completely different places and they never interact with each other, so, you know, humans living over in Spain, humans living over in Mexico, um, you know, they evolve to, to, you know, be suitable for their environment. And there are different diseases, and those diseases kill some humans, but then eventually those humans build up immunity to whatever the local diseases are. So then suddenly you come together. You may be immune from a certain disease that these people aren't. You might be carrying that disease, but it doesn't affect you because your body's built up an immunity. Now, suddenly it can become really easy to pass that disease along. We actually use that uh, in a very unfortunate way to help try to control the um, Native American population in this country. Um, you know, giving out blankets that were infected with... Um, smallpox or whatever diseases that the native people didn't ever you know weren't ever exposed to same thing happens with with wildlife you get species introduced into an area or in this case even just the disease gets introduced and can devastate a population in our area even biologists are really concerned about the white nose syndrome a, uh, again, it's a fungal disease that can get transmitted into a population and really devastate the population. If you ever go up to, for example, Lava Beds National Monument up in the kind of northeastern part of California, there are lots of caves up there that people can go check out, uh, walk around down there and look at stuff. Obviously, caves mean bats, uh, you know, a place where bats are going to hang out. And there's a lot of information, and, and they ask you when you go there, 
um, before they even really let you go in the cave or before you should go in the cave. They ask you whether or not you've ever been or recently been anywhere back east in a cave because you can pick up this fungus, the spores, just walking through the cave on your shoes. Then if you wear those same hiking boots a month later in, a, in another cave, you can transmit those spores, which can then lead to infecting the population of bats. So biologists have been dealing with that. Back to climate change. There are images uh, here shown of um, a specific glacier in Glacier National Park up in uh, Montana. And they're showing it from the from the 30s and then jumping ahead to the 80s and then the uh, the late 2000s. And, um, you know, especially if you focus kind of in the front of the image, all of the uh, the glacier that becomes a, a little bit of a glacier and, and some water in the 80s. And then eventually it's it's pretty much gone for the most part, just the temperature increase of, of a degree or two. I mean, if, if, if the temperature in your house was 74 or 76, you probably wouldn't really notice the difference, a degree or two. But when you're talking about the world average going up a degree or two, it's enough to literally melt glaciers. I, I in a very sad tone, um, always mention that, you know, in another couple of decades, we may have to rename Glacier National Park to Glacier Less National Park or pick some other name because those glaciers, which were the, you know, the, the real foundation of that park, um, may not be there. And, you know, and again, the, the trend may have been a certain way, but there's no doubt if you look at the data that we as humans have sped up the process. Again, you can look hundreds of millions of years back in our time, and there have been climatic changes and, um, and, and other things that are cyclic that lead to extinction. The um, Ordovician, the Devonian, the Permian, uh, the Triassic, the Cretaceous, each of those epochs were, were marked with certain sudden um, high levels of extinction. We refer to as mass extinctions. We've had five of them in the last, uh, you know, 450 plus million years. So we know there are cyclic, the cyclic nature is that we have changes to our planet that create extinctions. But again, the challenge is nothing is, is um, has ever happened at the, the, the quickness that this is happening today because of our effect on the environment. There have been a lot of species that have been hunted to extinction in, in recent human time, the dodo bird species that's you know, always kind of re referred to as when, when you're talking about something that goes away, it's always you know, gone like the dodo. <clears throat> that was a big kind of ugly bird. Didn't fly, as you can tell, by its puny little wings. Uh, once we discovered it on, on islands, um, you know, it was like a, like a turkey, but, but one that couldn't fly. So it was easy to kill them, use them for food. And um, because of the fact they didn't evolve with predators of any kind, they didn't even need to evolve any defenses. So when we come along, being a top predator in our environment, it was really easy for us to be able to drive those to extinction along with lots and lots of other species. Too many to, you know, to list here right now. Um, image that just shows, relatively speaking, the larger blocks of habitat you have, the larger forested area, the more species you're going to have. And since humans became more abundant on the planet, all we've done is continue to decrease the um, the blocks of habitat from again what would have initially been pretty much continuous habitat to now you know we cut this area to grow ag 
crops. We cut this area to make a Walmart. We clear this area to, you know, build a new subdivision. Keep doing that, and, and you, you know, again, you're going from big blocks of habitat to smaller and smaller ones. Talked about that with respect to, you know, the idea of island biogeography. So, again, the, the U.S. has been on the cutting edge of preserving diversity. Yellowstone National Park was the very first of its kind anywhere in the world as a public place that was set aside so everyone could go there and enjoy it, but not, you know, harvest trees or, or do other kind of destructive land uses. So we've been in the mode of preserving land for, you know, more than 100 and almost 150 years, 140 some years. The rest of the world is catching on and they're starting to, um, to uh, set aside preserves, you know, to maintain biodiversity. But, um, but like I said, a lot of the less developed countries are still directly dependent on their resources for their economy. So when it's balanced between, well, you know, can I cut these trees down and sell them to the United States and, and make money, whereas if I just set these trees aside and don't do anything with them, now where does that money come from? So it's a challenge in this country because we're relatively wealthy and, again, we've got a good education system and a university system that you know, that teaches how to, how to do this kind of stuff. Um, and, and because it's as much about tourism and, you know, maybe making money off of tourism rather than consumptive uses like, you know, digging coal or, or um, cutting trees down. We've been able to kind of keep moving in this direction with all of the land that we can set aside. Um, some of it we preserve like our national parks. Some of it we manage it and use it wisely, like our national forests. Um, but we sort of have that luxury in this country that, that a lot of other countries don't really have. But again, every time you go to a national park or even a forest or a monument, a big part of the goal of that land is to conserve biodiversity protect habitats and if you protect the habitat then you're protecting all the other living things that depend on it. It's especially important to do that in areas uh, where there are um, considered to be hot spots for biodiversity. Uh, Conservation International has identified 34 of those across the, uh, the surface of the earth. They only account for about 2% of the earth's land surface but almost half of the vertebrate species and plants are in just that 2% of the land. So again, we get a lot of bang for our buck if we can preserve those areas because we're preserving a lot of diversity by preserving small areas. Notice if you kind of zoom into North America, the California floristic province goes from uh, maybe, you know, somewhere in northern Oregon, southern Washington, all the way down to, you know, to uh, the Mexican border. There's a lot of people living in that area, right? There's 30 some million of us just in California, millions and millions more in Oregon and Washington. A lot of that land is already kind of, you can't save, you can't, you're not going to convert Los Angeles back to native habitat. You're not going to convert the Bay Area back to native habitat. You're not going to convert, um, you know, cities back to habitat that was, um, you know, 200 years ago. So even within those provinces, we still have to try and just find specific areas, small ones, maybe some big ones. There are a lot of national parks, monuments, national forest, wildlife refuges within that California floristic province. But even with the millions and millions and millions of acres, um, there's still a lot of it that isn't protected, or maybe it doesn't need to be protected, but it's already been changed in a way that, that you just can't fix it. You can't get it back. 
So you just work with what you got. You do the best with what you got and try to preserve as much as you can, as much as what is still left, and then keep it from being destroyed more than it already is. And again, you can literally not clear cut a forest within there or, or not clear area to, to grow food. But if we keep letting the climate change because of what we're doing to our environment, that's going to impact every one of those um, hot spots on the planet just because of our um, maybe lack of ability to transition from a petroleum-based society to a more renewable resource. Um, and we're going to have to do it eventually. It's just a matter of time. Hopefully it's a matter of sooner than later, but it is a matter of time before we just cannot keep using petroleum because it's going to be gone or it's going to be so rare that it's going to be impossible to, you know, to find it or it's going to be so expensive that it's going to be prohibitive to use it. We're going to have to switch to a different fundamental source of our, uh, you know, heating and cooling and automobiles and transportation before we run out of petroleum if we're going to keep the planet from, you know, crashing on us. Again, in this country, we've even brought species back that we drove to um, extinction in certain areas. There were still wolves in North America, but, but we shot them, uh, eliminated them completely from places like Yellowstone. Even the state I grew up in had wolves, Wisconsin. And just as I was leaving to, to go to Texas for graduate school, the biologists started reintroducing wolf packs. Uh, to get them back in the environment and, and playing the important role that predators uh, provide as keystone species. Even Yellowstone National Park, as huge as it is, is still just a little piece of a habitat compared to 200 years ago. But again, this is, you know, this is, uh, we can do what we can do, try to get the ecosystem as back and healthy as possible. And then finally, um, you know, again, unfortunately, I, I use the word unfortunately, but it's the only way in some cases we can keep things from completely going extinct is to bring them into captivity, into zoos or captive breeding programs, and then breed those species so that we still have living examples of things like this gold lion tamarind. The goal is ultimately, I think, for most biologists that if we can eventually, you know, stop habitat destruction and, and maybe even restore the habitat, that at least if these are still alive, even if in a zoo, we can eventually start putting them back out into their, their habitat. But again, that's only going to happen if we stop the habitat destruction and then, then we can restore the habitat to make it suitable. And, and, and enough of that habitat so that species have, um, you know, enough area to, to live and thrive and, and meet all their requirements. So this is kind of the, the doom and gloom section of the class, all of the challenges that, uh, that we face. And um, a lot of these challenges are going to be um, really, really difficult for us to address. Because they're so big, it's going to require us pushing our legislators to make good decisions, allowing biologists to do their job, to manage the land in a way that's best for as many things as possible. Some of that's going to have to be allowing foresters to manage the land, thin the land out so it's less prone to catastrophic fires. So all the plants that are still there are healthier and they thrive. And if they thrive, then all the other animals and plants are going to thrive um, while still meeting all the needs that we have, uh, uh, you know, the demand we have for resources. We always are going to have, hopefully, a demand for wood. Wood is the ultimate renewable, reusable, recyclable um, product that provides so many values to us. And again, we 
ha- uh, in, in this country and in this state, we have the knowledge to do a good job of managing our forests so that we can cut trees down to make paper and wood and everything else um, while still providing good habitat, good homes for the wildlife. But um, again, in, in this country in general and in California in particular, we're really hurt by the, the, the overly strict regulations in some cases. So something that you all are going to have to have a role in if we really want things to start trending or, or keep trending in a more positive direction. Just remember, again, the bottom line is if, if we don't harvest products in this country in a way that's sustainable, those products are going to come from somewhere. And they're probably going to come from a country that doesn't give a crap the way we do cut as many trees down as possible to make as much money as possible. doesn't matter if the tamarind goes extinct. It's just some cute little animal, but it's not, you know, as valuable as a tree. We don't think that way in this country. But by, but unfortunately we kind of do. Because if, again, if we put off on other countries providing us with the resources we need instead of doing a good job that we can do, we're basically not giving a crap if the tamarind goes extinct. I don't know a single biologist, a single forester that's like, all right, I get to go out and kill a bunch of trees today. That's my whole goal in life, destroy the environment for the sake of killing a bunch of trees. I'm exaggerating, but I don't know any biologist that thinks anything like that. And yet a lot of people that live in the cities and and get a little bit brainwashed by certain environmental organizations make, they sort of have that perception that biologists or foresters in particular don't care about the environment. And uh, and that leads them to fight for laws that, that really are restrictive and that force us to have to buy products from other countries that don't have laws at all, or very few regulations, or no idea how to properly manage the environment. So there's the Dr. Doom speech for the day, but um, so your last quiz is or will be available, and um, this pretty much wraps up the course. So hopefully um, you'll kind of finish strong for the semester. And um, whatever you have planned over break, wish the best for you. And as always, make sure you get in contact with me me if you have any questions uh, as we wrap the semester up. So good luck with that. And um, maybe we'll have you again in another class in the future. Appreciate it.